G'day Brewers, in this video we're going to touch on the serious subject of product recalls and how your brewery can best manage them. Let's get brewing. My name is Hendo and I'm from Rockstar Brewer. I help breweries grow their business by making high quality beer that win wins medals, sells like hotcakes and is fun to make. If you want to know more about that, hit me up on the website. And if you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing. So today I'm going to be talking with a uh, couple of uh, friends and clients of mine, um, Dan Norris and Michael McGovern from Black Hops Brewing. They're located on the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. Uh, they're a pretty well-known brand here in Australia. They have national distribution. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about product recall. So uh, to set the scene, late last year, uh, Black Hops um, had a situation with the beer that went out into the market uh, as part of a uh, Christmas advent calendar. Um, and that beer became over carbonated once it was released and out in the market. Now for a brewery, this is, act this is the ultimate um, nightmare scenario and I don't use those words lightly because as professional brewers we put so much effort into making our beer with such a quality focus uh, that when something does go wrong um, it, it, it hurts deep you know it cuts really deep and so when a brewery does encounter that situation um, it's important that the brewery handles it in a way that's ultimately transparent. So in today's chat with Dan uh, and Govzy, we're going to talk about what happened, how they managed the situation, um, what they did to prepare for a product recall, and what improvements they made to their brewery uh, and their brewery and their production operation uh, to lower the risk of this happening again in the future. So. Uh, and if you stick around to the end of the video, uh, Govzy's going to take us on a tour of his brand spanking new lab that just went live this week. Uh, and so be sure to stick around for that. So without any further ado, let's get cracking and have a chat to Dan and Govzy from Black Ops Brewing. Cheers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> G'day everybody, uh, Hendo here from Rockstar Brewer. Um, Today, uh, we're going to talk about a subject that uh, not many brewers tend to really think about until they have to do it in a reactionary way, and that is product recall. And uh, today, I'm joined by uh, Dan Norris and Michael Gubbs McGovern from Black Ops Brewing on the Gold Coast in Queensland. How are you going, guys? Good. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Govzy's on 4G, so if he, if he looks a bit sketchy, that's just <laughs> how he normally is. Yeah, so, mate, I can hear you guys really well. Hopefully you can hear me too. Yeah, good, good. Awesome, mate. Um, so um, thanks for coming on today. I just wanted to um, have a chat with you guys today about um, a topic that doesn't really often get discussed um, in the brewing scene, um, and that's... Um, uh, the the issue of product recall. Um, we all sort of try really hard to uh, to make our beer as best we can, but like most things in life, nothing is guaranteed. And um, uh, there was a a, um, a situation that happened with you guys uh, late last year. And um, could you just run us through exactly what happened? Well, yeah, we we brewed a beer for the beer advent calendar with an online delivery service called Beer Cartel, and it was brewed a few months in advance, kind of right in the middle of when we were work, uh, building a new brewery and expanding and working on the quality manual and refining all of that stuff. And it kind of slipped through a few of those checks, sat in a warehouse for a few months warm, and the cans started exploding as they were being sent out to customers. Mm. When, when, did you, when did it first bring, bring itself to your attention? We didn't know about it until uh, Lockie from Beer Cartel rung me up and said, w w we've just gotten to the end of this pallet. We're packing these things and sending them out and these cans in the warehouse are exploding. And that was on memory, I think it was on a Friday afternoon at like two o'clock. Yeah. And, and I went and grabbed Govs and we, and Eddie, we sat around the table and then worked out what the hell we we're going to do. So just describe the concept of, the, of, a, of a beer advent calendar for those who may not be uh, Australian. 
um, and sort of what happens here in Australia around Christmas time? Yeah, well, I mean, the idea is a different beer every day throughout Christmas and our beer was an, a bigger version of our eggnog stout, which is our flagship beer. And it was the beer that they were going to release on Christmas Day. So that made it even more painful. It had the, uh, the pride of place on the 25th of December, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, Gubsy, how did you first hear about uh, the, the issue and um, um, what sort of, uh, like, investigations did you undertake when you first sort of found out about the problem? Yeah, well, I first found out from Dan because he was, uh, that was when we first discovered it was an issue. It was being such a unique um, product. It was all supplied to the one customer as a one-off. Um, it, uh, it only, like, there was only one place that it could start becoming a problem. So as soon as that came up, um, you know, immediately I went and started doing my investigation in terms of um, trying to, you know, find the root cause analysis. And, and, you know, unfortunately, it was just one of those cases that, it was a, a perfect storm of, of cock-ups and uh, it had just literally slipped through the cracks um, in our quality process. And uh, unfortunately, um, it became apparent quite quickly, like the beer had just not completed fermentation in packaging. Um, and that was, that was missed um, in our testing in, in the fact that it wasn't completed. Um, and it also, at that time, we were sending off all of our beers um, to an external lab to be tested. And um, unfortunately, that gear did not get sent off either. So, it, yeah, it was just that, that perfect storm of problems. Yeah, What's it was going on. It, it was a problem because we, we sort of, we have like two aspects to our business. We've got like, you know, a business that sells lots of cans into major retailers. And then we've got this crazy experimental side where we brew all these small batches just for the tap room. They get drunk very quickly. Um, they're really experimental. They, they don't really go through the same rigorous process that you would have to go through for beer that's sitting out warm in a DC somewhere for Woolies and Coles. Yeah. Um, and this beer was just a weird in-between beer that we, we kind of looked at like an experimental limited release, but really, given that it was sitting there warm for a couple of months in a warehouse and was going to be part of this calendar, it probably we probably should have been extra careful to make sure that we did do all the checks we were supposed to do um, for it. Yeah, right. Um, so um, when, um, when, when did it come to the point where uh, you decided that uh, you needed to recall the product and what was the process that, it, that both you guys sort of went through uh, in order to make that decision? You better tell us which one's... Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. look, at it. look at you and again, Gubsy. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know who you were directing. No, that's question. okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of the recall, like we, um, we, we had a recall plan in, in our folder. Um, it wasn't necessarily something that we were anticipating on, on actioning anytime soon. Um, and it was something that we hadn't actually used before so we were pretty green on it um, but luckily we did actually have something written down uh, and a process to follow and in that we have um, there are different different roles and responsibilities on, on determining uh, first of all is the product uh, deemed to be worthy of a recall so that was kind of the steps that we went through and it was um, very much you know follow up follow the questions and answer them and then and move on to the next part and um, yeah, we, we kind of divided those roles up between us and, and came to the conclusion that um, we, we believed that we should recall it. And so what was the basis that you decided um, that it was going to be a recall? Because, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I sort of talk to my clients about is that you can have, like, what's called a pullback, which is where, um, you know, something's just not the way that you wanted it to look and taste and smell. Maybe it might have accidentally gotten oxidised or something like that. And then there are other things which, which warrants a recall where there is a, uh, a risk to public health. Um, with your particular, particular situation, Gubsy, was it a recall or was it a pullback? And, if, and, and why was it either? 
yeah, sure. So in our case, it, it was a definite recall. Um, we did believe that it posed a, a, a health threat to, to the public in terms that the, the beer was over-carbonating um, and bursting, which mm-hmm. you know, could pose a, a physical threat to people. Um, obviously not anywhere near as much as if it was in a glass bottle, but it still was present. Uh, all, and the other reason was that the, the beer was, because um, it continued to ferment, the alcohol content was much higher than what was stated on the label. So it was, um, you know, another, it was a compliance issue as well, safety in the fact that the alcohol percentage that it said on the label was not match what the, the product was inside. So um, we also had, you know, the great opportunity, uh, well, the great luck, I guess you'd say, is that all of that beer went essentially to one customer. Uh, who repackaged it and sent it out to uh, end users, who all of which we had, you know, orders and addresses and contact details for. Yeah, so that was kind of going to be my uh, my next question there. In that, um, um, what was sort of the difference there in your situation because it went to uh, that one batch of beer went to one retailer um, that must have made finding those people who bought that beer much easier than, say, uh, if that beer went to, say, one of the major retailers or something like that, Dan? Yeah, well, I I guess that was, in a way, lucky for us because we could just contact Beer Cartel. They knew exactly who'd bought these cartons. Um, So they could quite easily contact them straight away with a solution. So so from that point of view, it was... was, you know, a, it was a safe outcome. No one was going to get hurt unless they deliberately kept the beer and kept it warm and, you know, didn't do what we said to do. So that was good. Um, and it also meant we didn't have to sort of do... We contacted the health department and whatnot, but we didn't have to do any massive advertising or anything because everyone knew who had the beer and that, that meant you didn't need to put ads in newspapers and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I suppose that was that was a benefit to us. It, it, it was also though potentially a bit of a challenge because if it had gone out to bottle shops, we could have offered some sort of refund at, at the tap room if people collected it. But because we knew exactly where it went, we sort of had to go back to people and say, give them a very specific refund or um, coupon code or some some sort of compensation for every single individual that got that beer. That was very expensive, and and it's fine. It was our mistake, we paid for it, but it, it was potentially more expensive because we knew exactly where the beer ended up. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, um, how, how much difficult, more difficult do you think it would have been if it had it gone to say one of the major retailers or something like that? Well, I don't know. We've never done that before. So. <laughs> I'm touching wood, mate. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Um, when Dan, questions for you. So, when you found out that there was an issue and there was a very high potential for uh, to have to recall the product before that decision was actually made to recall the product, was there ever any temptation to um, downplay the situation with the public or deny it or sweep it under the rug or anything like that? No, I mean, we we just sort of have transparency as something we value. It's not really in our nature to hide things like that. So there was never any discussion of that. It was just, you know, it was quite obvious what the right thing to do was, even though it was a painful thing for us to do. So there was never any discussion of that. I think, um, like, like th- th- there have been cases where a beer, you know, you get a message from a customer and, one beer out of a four pack wasn't 100 percent right you know in that case we don't recall the whole batch there's been cases of like that but this was quite clear that there was a number of cans exploding across different four packs across different cartons it was obvious that it was something that was that was the whole batch um and once govs did the tests back at the brewery it was clear that the beer was over carb or had re-fermented in the can like we knew just by looking at the can that we had but it was higher ABV. We tested it. We knew that it was. It was obvious. It was the liquid inside the can, and every single can. So that never crossed our mind. But in, in saying that, it seems like some other breweries did take that approach with that calendar. And I, d- I don't know if their situation wasn't as serious as ours. But it seemed like there was a bunch of beers in there that had re-fermented, and the breweries were sort of saying everything was fine. But 
ours was pretty obvious, like cans were exploding in the warehouse. Mm. Um, so it was the only decision we even considered really. Did you ever worry about sort of damage to your brand and that sort of thing? No, I think, I think these sort of things have happened to the best brands in our industry. And if they're handled well, normally people come out of it with their heads held high. So that's what we wanted to do. Yeah, okay. And um, so, uh, Dan, sort of following up from the recall and that sort of thing, you went through a process to actually recover the beer where possible or, uh, if I remember correctly, the consumers were told to carefully dispose of it. Most people, I saw a lot of people disposing of it like that, um, uh, which was amusing to say the least. Um, probably not the best, probably not following instructions, but not very cool, but um, can't really stop them. Um, so what, um, I'll throw this one over to you, Govzy. What, what did you learn in terms of uh, your production process in the brewery uh, and what sort of changes have you made uh, in order to minimise the risk of that happening, that sort of situation happening again where there's re-fermentation impact? Yeah, sure. So we, um, we immediately identified that there were, I guess you'd say, holes in our net. Um, so while we did have certain processes in place that were designed to detect and catch these sorts of things and prevent them from happening. Um, what we, we found was there was the you know, opportunity for it to, to slide through um, slide through our fingers and get out the door. So um, I you know, immediately started looking at our processes um, and we changed the way that we um, sign off and release products. So before um, beer is made available to sell, it gets... It goes through a more rigorous um, sign-off process that gets checked to make sure that these critical tests um, have not only been completed but are actually um, have passed. So that was something that was you know, relatively easy to introduce. However, at that time, you know, obviously my first reaction was to, to deal with the, the problem at hand, but. Um, straight away, I was like, well, if this one has slipped for us, because um, potentially we had, you know, 20, 30 batches of beer out in the market that could also have potentially had, you know, the same problem. Um, luckily, that wasn't the case for us. But, yeah, it was a pretty scary couple of months um, after that. We went through and, you know, we're testing everything that we had and trying to make, trying to find to make sure that there, there wasn't going to be another extra eggnog, you know, the, the week after the first one, because that would have been incredibly damaging to us. You know, you can get away with these kinds of things once um, and handle them well, but if it becomes an ongoing problem, quickly, um, you know, your brand starts, your reputation um, really starts to go through the mud and that becomes a very difficult place to recover from. Yeah, absolutely. Very difficult to um, uh, recover from um, repeated quality issues out in the field. I think consumers these days are much more... Uh, fickle in terms of their demand for high quality beer and that sort of thing. Um, you talk about like the, the checks and balances that you put in place, Gubsy. That sounds like a lot of work for you. How did you manage the sort of the 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 uh, the, the people aspect of that? You're a busy man already. <laughs> it's an incredible amount of work, and um, you know, um, I definitely couldn't have. Could have done it all without without yourself and you know the help of your your rockstar brewer program. Um, there's half of the, half of the work is putting it in and uh, and doing these implementing these processes, um, and the other half is is all the the paperwork and organising that goes behind it. So you and I, you know, we've we've been working together for over twelve months on our quality side, and um, we we made a hell of a lot of progress from about November onwards. <laughs> I was I was not talking about plug and me. It's turned about, into an infomercial. I know oh, exactly. Mate. I don't want it to turn into an infomercial. That's that was the idea. Well, I'm, oh man, I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a it was a lot of work, and um, yeah, it, it required not only having the right um, resources in terms of staff. So we we took on some some extra staff because we were we were pretty um, pretty short short skinned on that. Um, we we hired a, a full time quality manager that could could just focus entirely on doing 
our quality side of things and that that took away the um the onus on the brewers to be testing their own work um which is uh, you know i'm a firm believer on you know you always have someone else check check the work to make sure it's right um and um from my perspective um uh, having some extra staff allowed me to step out of the day-to-day -day running of of the brewery and, and focus more on the quality side of things yeah absolutely <laughs> Um, that's kind of where I was going was <laughs> not what you and I've been doing, but <laughs> the fact have you got some sort of coupon code or something? <laughs> <laughs> we might need it. Um, so Dan, um, on that basis that, um, you know, um, Gubsy's had to sort of increase his human resource budget there to sort of, um, manage that risk going forward. Um, how, how do you see value in that, um, you know, particularly around Govzy uh, hiring a quality manager in relation to the risk around what this recall actually cost you? Yeah, well, we, we'd, um, wait, I think Lou's actually there, so I better be nice if she's there. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, the quality manager's shit. <laughs> no, she's great. We, we, we'd planned on doing this stuff anyway. We when we built the original, well, well, when we planned to build Black Ops 2, we had in the budget um, a whole bunch of stuff for a lab and equipment and whatnot. And it was always part of the plan to do all that stuff. It just took us a little bit longer. And businesses like this, as you know, Hendo, they're pits of money and they run out and you can only do so much. So we, we probably, you know, ideally we would have had that lab that we've just built ready when we launched the brewery, but it, the reality was that we just weren't in a position to have that ready. Um, but the plan was always to have the lab, have someone doing the tests in house and then um, have someone to report to govs on all of that stuff. So this, this accelerated that plan a little bit, but there was nothing surprising in that. That was always going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the circumstances brought those things. Well, a major undertaking to build a second brewery and a much bigger one at that and, and to do it as fast as what you guys did it. Um, that, that there's always going to be things that sort of slip through the cracks there, but it's but I guess situations like these really sort of highlight how um, important it is to actually make that investment, not only in plant and equipment, but also people and process. Yeah, uh, that sort of thing. So yeah, um, and we, we've had to scale up production really quickly. I mean, this is pre-virus, but we sort of doubled the size of our production in the space of about twelve months or less, probably seven eight months, and so just the challenges associated with that are enormous. And then you add in a new lab and a quality person and all these different processes for checking beer and all of that. It's a huge amount of work. Um, so I'll, 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 um, I'll wrap up and sort of ask each of you the same question. So starting with you, Dan, um, if you were going to offer some advice to other breweries out there who are going through sort of a similar growth trajectory uh, and that sort of thing as you guys are, what advice would you give them um, with respect to managing product recall um, um, in terms of um, how, to, how to lower that risk and how to actually deal with it should the situation arise? Well, I mean, lowering the risk is, is all about processes. Like, like before we worked on the quality manual here with Rockstar Brewer Academy... <laughs> Um, I've, got a, I've got my wallet on my pocket here. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Pineapple. Chuck, chuck in, slide into the DMs there and give me a <laughs> Um But yeah, we, we it, it's all about processes. Like like that that beer in particular fell down because we didn't have the same process that we have now. We missed the checks. All those reasons that Gubbs talked about. So having a quality manual, having a process is super important to avoid it. But if you if you can't avoid it, which I'm sure every other brewery is going to end up in the same position where well, maybe not every other brewery, but it's it's going to be a common thing where breweries are in this position. I think there's really only one way to handle it, and that is honestly and um, in a transparent way, and just just remembering that the health of the customer is the most important thing, even though it's a hard thing to go through. That's the first obligation, and um, we're not the first brewery to do a recall. There's, there was plenty before us. There was Stone and Wood. I think Newstead, um, Ether, a bunch of others locally who all handled it very well and we were able to look at what they did, in some cases reach out to them for some advice 
um, and just make sure we were honest about it and handle it the only way you can, which is be honest and uh, do your best to tell people about it, refund the beer and improve your processes so it doesn't happen again. Mm-hmm. Do you think your business is better off for it now? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we probably needed a bit of a kick up the ass just to make sure that we were following everything perfectly. And um, we know the pain of going through that again is not something we particularly want to go through if we can avoid it. So I think we've made, uh, Govs has made a lot of progress on quality and production management, um, which I'm sure we would have made some of that progress anyway. But, but yeah, no, I think it's helped. Mm, awesome. How about you, uh, Govsy? Same questions is like... Um, um, you know, how do you, uh, what, 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 would, what advice would you give to fellow uh, head brewers slash brewmasters such as yourself uh, in the industry to sort of uh, lower the risk and, and deal with it if, if something happens? Yeah, sure. So it's a really um, challenging aspect of what we do. We, as craft brewers, we're typically, you know, the, the small players and, and we're trying to compete in, in a big field. Um, so we're starting to branch our products outside of our tap rooms, outside of our local areas um, and, you know, into bottle shops, into distribution networks and um, slowly but surely that beer becomes um, harder con- to control and more susceptible to problems. So um, part of that is, part of managing that is just, first of all, obviously identifying what the risks are to your product. You know, if you're, uh, if you're having unpasteurized, unfiltered, beer out there, then, you know, there's a lot of uh, micrological um, problems that, that can creep up and it's the case of just writing them down, doing, you know, a bit of a, a risk first reward. Um, what can we do to lower the risk on certain aspects and what can we do to eliminate others? Uh, and just having that, that real methodical approach to it and, um, and having ways to validate your results. So make sure that whatever testing methods you have, available to you. You know, you don't need to go out and build, you know, a hundred thousand dollar lab. There's a lot of really good, simple ways of testing some key aspects of, of beer spoilage and, and beer problems. Um, so, you know, for us, it was, um, you know, a finishing gravity problem. Beer was, um, it was acknowledged as being final and, um, and it wasn't. So, you know, tests to, to confirm that are, are pretty simple to do. Um, but having that, not just having the, the test, but having the, the release checking at the end of it so that, you know, someone is signing off that we have done all our checks because that was really our problem. It wasn't that we didn't, we, weren't, we didn't identify that the risk exists or we didn't have a process in which to test it. It's just, it slipped through and didn't get done and there wasn't someone at the end going, yeah, we've done all these tests before we send this beer out. Mm. It sounds like it's a it's a one of those growing pains kind of problems as you because your team has expanded in your brewing team has expanded in number and also you've got two breweries and four brew houses. Um, the complexity in running that sort of production operation must be quite challenging. Oh yeah, but it's it's fuck it's fun though when we get it right. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. That's good. So the really good thing about um, yeah. holy moly, that looks amazing. It's fucking legit. Yeah. Show us again. Cool. That's impressive. What's over there on the left? Uh, here, uh, we've got a little orbital shaker. We've got yeah. a um, beer lab, the little yeah, yeah, um, yeah, the enzymatic kit. Yeah, a little centrifuge um, pH meter. Yeah. This There's is a kettle. That's a um, jewellery cleaner I bought off Kogan, which is also a great little um, to knock out CO2. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For uh, and then we've got a little still, which we do all our VDK testing in there. Yeah. That's then, great. And then our little um, thermocycler and, and another centrifuge. That's looking pretty good, mate. Yeah, it's, it's fucking, it's coming together. It's, well, it's, it's now up and running, so exciting so we're starting to fill it out we've got a nice clean place to do all our testing loose stoked yeah that's really good man that is super thanks very much for your uh, for your time today and um uh if uh, you're a brewer out there if you're an australian brewer in particular um a really good resource to 
uh, help you plan for and manage the process of recall would be the Independent Brewers Association product recall plan. It's a really good place to start. Um, the work that um, that myself and Govs did uh, on, on this recall planning uh, was born out of that sort of framework, which is based on the um, Food Standards Australia New Zealand um, standards. So I'll leave a link to that in the description below and you can get cracking from there. Uh, Dan, Govsy, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, that was a super fun chat and... Um, uh, hopefully we'll get to do another one soon because I think we're like one for one now because I've been on your show like way too many times and this is the first time you've been on mine. We are you. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having us on. <laughs> no sweat, guys. Have a great day. Cheers. Cheers, mate.